is the Rob Carson Show. Are you ready to be pod smacked? Now, here's Rob Carson. Hello and welcome to episode number 35 of the Rob Carson Show podcast. I hope you're doing very well. I've been very busy. I'm going to tell you some of the things that are going on, uh, not only in my life, but also uh, in the world today. Uh, Today I'm recording this on the, what is already the 16th of February, 2017. Um, I just launched my website. It is robcarsonshow.com. Robcarsonshow.com. You can go there and you can see uh, what I've been up to. Also, my uh, video and audio podcasts, um, social media links, and other things. And more things are coming. More things are coming. So uh, check it out. And again, also, uh, we've got this uh, this Facebook page, Rob Carson Show. And then I've also got a, uh, a cooking blog called Rob Carson's Table. So uh, I've been very busy. I'm doing right now. Uh, an overnight shift on KMOX in St. Louis. And it's uh, midnight to three. And this radio station is uh, a legend. KMOX is a 50,000 watt, what they call a clear channel radio station, meaning it's the only station that has the frequency 1120. And at night, it can be heard all over the country. It is a, a terrific honor to be on that radio station. So, uh, at least this week, I'm on from midnight to 3 in the morning. And then I hope to do more with KMOX, with social media, with video, uh, and other things. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. But uh, it is an honor and a privilege to be on there. And I thank my friend Steve Moore, who's the program director, for helping me out in doing that. Today is a day without immigrants. I didn't know if you knew this. <clears throat> uh, apparently, uh, immigrants around the country are taking the day off because of Donald Trump's immigration policy. Here's a story about the day without immigrants today, the 16th of February. We want to let them know that we're not criminals. we workers. We support our country. Philadelphia restaurant owner David Pena, one of many restaurateurs across the country closing up shop Thursday in protest of President Trump's immigration policies. The goal of the social media-born grassroots movement dubbed hashtag a day without... Sure, it's grassroots. ...at immigrants is to show the importance of immigrants in American society. New York's Blue Ribbon Restaurant Group also shutting down most of its locations Thursday. Well-known restaurants are also closing in a place that Washington is likely to notice, the nation's capital itself, including high-profile spots owned by celebrity chef Jose Andres. By the way, uh, Jose Andres uh, hailed my 40th birthday. He's a hell of a nice guy. I am an immigrant myself, an Hispanic Mexican myself. Andres, currently involved in a legal battle with Trump over a restaurant lease, says he expects to lose nearly $100,000 from Thursday's closing but emphasized how important he thinks the movement is. We have people that they are part of the DNA, that they are working on golf courses, maybe owned by Mr. Trump himself, in restaurants, in farms. Immigrants accounted for 7.1 million of the nation's restaurant workers in 2015, compared to 5.1 million who were native-born. And in 2014, roughly 1.1 million of the industry's workers were undocumented, according to Pew Research Analysis. Okay, now... The immigration policy is not going after people who uh, who just are here illegally. All right. They're going after uh, criminal aliens. That's what's happening right now. And these uh, massive strikes aren't going to do anything positive. All they're going to do is hurt the businesses and the people who work there a day without pay unless they're giving them a day off with pay. And uh, these things, uh, the, this whole nationwide strike thing, there's, uh, there's one coming up for women. Women are going to, it's going to be a day without women. A day without women. And women everywhere, supposedly, uh, because of this unfocused, I guess, feminist movement against Donald Trump, all in for Bill Clinton, but away against Donald Trump, this is supposed to go nationwide. I doubt very seriously. <clears throat> and I doubt very seriously that the day without immigrants is going to be a... I, I, I can go up here to the Chipotle, I can go up here to the Panera, and I can get a sandwich right now. They're not closed. Uh, and and this this over the top reaction and largely uninformed reaction doesn't help the cause. Doesn't help the cause. There is a lot of uh, caterwauling going on, a lot of panic going on in the country, and a lot of people have basically lost their minds. Piers Morgan actually the other night. I'm I'm actually beginning to like Piers Morgan when he's on CNN. If he would have talked like this on CNN, he'd still have a show. He works for the UK Daily Mail. And he's talking about how 
Uh, people in the U.S., not only politicians, but uh, just regular people have lost their minds over Donald Trump without just cause. I don't think it's just the media. I think there are large swathes of the American people who've lost their minds. And the media are <laughs> yeah, fueling true. this crazy hysteria. You know, here's what I think has happened. The media in America, the mainstream media, print and cable and, and main network news, they kind of collaborated in fueling the beast of Donald Trump. When he first ran... They started by saying he was a joke. Then they realized he was getting ratings. Then they gave him the airtime. Then they put him on the front pages. They kept fueling, fueling, fueling. But they never imagined he might actually win. And while they were fueling, he was out there running around America, galvanizing and resonating with the American people. In yes, and connecting with people who are suffering in this country and don't live in New York or California. Little America, way away from the two, the two coasts. Yes, thank you. And then came the moment when the American media went, we've got to kill this guy off. This is, this is out of control. And that's what's going on right now, by the way. A rather like Dr. Frankenstein, it was too late. Uh, the beast that they had helped create, as they see it, could not be killed off, and he won the presidency. What I don't like about what is going on now is there is an absolutely frenzied and concerted attempt to delegitimize, sabotage, and destroy the Trump presidency before it's even started. For instance, uh, Mike Flynn as national security advisor. By the way, there was a new, uh, new story out today that an intelligence official apparently has told NPR there's no evidence Michael Flynn broke the law on the phone calls with the Russian ambassador that led to his resignation as national security advisor. Thought you should know. It's not Watergate, kids. I think that is un-American. I don't think it's a patriotic thing that they're doing. I think it's nakedly partisan. It's driven by the New York Times, who yes. were completely in the tank for Hillary Clinton. Yes. Uh, and I think that as a journalist who worked at CNN for four years, where CNN always tried to be, I know your view about CNN, but has a lot of good people there. Um, I think they've got to be careful, all of them. They've got to look at what they're doing here and ask themselves, is this legitimate journalistic rigor, or is it incredibly partisan, often nakedly abusive treatment of a new president. That's exactly what it is. That's exactly what it is. Donald Trump did a uh, press conference today, just wrapped up, and I will share some audio from Donald Trump's uh, presser where he took the media to, to task today, uh, particularly CNN. And he, was, he did it, I thought, in a, in a very um, calm, collected, even humorous manner. So I'll share some of the details on that. But I, I think all of this is going to uh, boomerang on people who are so stridently anti-Trump. The, the cries of, uh, of uh, he's, a, he's a racist, he's a uh, sexist, he's a Islamophobic person, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, and he's Hitler. He's Hitler. That's another thing. See, once you, once you take uh, Hitler out of the quiver, um, that's it. I mean, you can't go much further than Hitler. All right. I mean, who, who else are you going to go Stalin next? I guess once you've done that and people realize that he's not Adolf Hitler, uh, you've lost all credibility. Here's Piers Morgan again talking about uh, these idiotic Hitler comparisons, which always come out when conservatives are in office. I mean, to me, I'm sorry, but I just find this Hitler stuff with Donald Trump unbelievably offensive for two reasons. One, you know, Adolf Hitler killed 12 million people including a systematic extermination of six million Jews in the Holocaust. This is not something we should be trivially throwing around about other people unless they have done similar acts. Donald Trump, to my knowledge, has not murdered anybody. All right, so this, this analogy of him... Can the same thing be said about the Clintons? Just, just saying. Being the new Hitler, I find incredibly offensive. I also think it diminishes the scale and importance and horror of what Hitler did. So I think that should just be shut down. Thank you. But Thank of course, you. you try and say this, and if you're not prepared now in the liberal world to say that he's the new Hitler, and you're not prepared to say every Muslim is banned from the country, you yourself then become the devil. And that's what happened to me. Right? Okay, that's what, and that is what is happening right now. And it is shameful when you win, for instance, and I've been saying this for 25 years on the radio, when you cry racism and there's no racism, it just cheapens the argument. We're seeing a lot of that. And this whole Hitler comparison, first of all, it's an, it's, it's an insult to the people who voted for the man. And by the way, in a, in a few minutes, I'm going to share some new Rasmussen polling. His approval ratings going through the ceiling. And I think part of it is people are just uh, tired of the crap here. <laughs> you know, tired of this over-the-top attacks while things are actually getting done.
Huh? And and speaking of Israel and thinking of anti-Semitism, uh, Bibi Netanyahu had a presser with uh, the president yesterday, and immediately put to to rest the uh, the concept that some are floating that Trump is somehow anti-Semitic, even though he embraces Israel like no president has done in years. Something that I know from personal experience, I've known President Trump for many years, and to allude to him uh, or to his people his team, some of whom I've known for many years, too. Can I reveal, Jared, how long we've known you? <laughs> well, he, he was never small. He was always big. <laughs> he was always tall. But I've, I've known the president, and I've known his family and his team for a long time. And there is no greater supporter of the Jewish people and the Jewish state than President Donald Trump. I think we should put that to rest. And I think we have. I think we have. Uh, Bibi Netanyahu we, we requested an audience with Barack Obama several times when he was in the United States and was summarily rejected. All right. Barack Obama sat in the pews of a, uh, a rabid anti-Semite for 21 years or 22 years, Reverend Wright. He's an anti-Semite. Black liberation theology is largely anti-Semitic. And that that's without a doubt our relationship with Israel was damaged. But the American people, I saw a poll today, of people, American people over, overwhelmingly support the Jewish state. Here's a, this is kind of a fun exchange yesterday. I mean, I'm enjoying the dynamic that, uh, that uh, and this is not all, all must be just rah-rah Donald Trump, rah-rah Donald Trump. But I'm enjoying some of these pressers. He had a presser with the uh, Prime Minister of England, and uh, it, was, it was humorous, it was light, it was comfortable. Uh, and the same could be said yesterday when Donald Trump uh, basically said he's hoping to get uh, uh, Israel to stop uh, building settlements in the West Bank. As far as settlements, I'd like to see you hold back on settlements for a little bit. Uh, we'll uh, work something out, but I would like to see a deal be made. I think a deal will be made. I know that every president would like to. Most of them have not started till late because they never thought it was possible. And it wasn't possible because they didn't do it. But Bibi and I have known each other a long time. A smart man, great negotiator. And I think we're going to make a deal. It might be a bigger and better deal than people in this room even understand. That's a possibility. So let's see what we do. Let's try it. <laughs> Doesn't sound too optimistic. There you go. <laughs> He's a good negotiator. That's the art of the deal. I also want to thank. There you go. There you go. See, I, I don't know. I like it, and I like the fact that we're uh, we're rekindling our relationship with with Israel. I always like to say that Israel is the uh, geographical equivalent of a fingernail clipping. Uh, that's how small it is, and it's surrounded by people who hate it. And I've always had a uh, a kinship with uh, the Jewish people. Uh, because they are one of the most put-upon groups in the history of mankind, and I, I support them. Okay, so on with the uh, the latest Rasmussen presidential tracking poll. 55% of likely U.S. voters approve of President Trump's job performance. 45% disapprove. All right? This uh, latest figure includes 38% who strongly approve of the way Trump is performing, 36 who strongly disapprove. This gives him a presidential approval rating index of plus 2 all right. So I think that some of this is that people are seeing some positives with the economy. They're seeing some positives with the Trump agenda and some of the things that he's done. They're seeing, for instance, in Texas, there is a major uh, border uh, holding point for uh, immigrants, illegals, to be uh, held and then released into the wholesale into the fabric of society, which has been happening for the last eight years. Right now, they have to close it down because there's not enough people to come across the border. So just saying build the wall, just espousing uh, getting rid of criminally legals has helped to stop the flow of illegals across the border. So there, there is that. There also is just the, the rabid attacks that are going on in the media from, uh, from celebrities to, uh, to uh, news networks like CNN – Michael Moore calling for the immediate removal and impeachment of Donald Trump and replaced with Hillary Clinton like he holds any sway whatsoever. I mean, he might have some sway at like, uh, I don't know, a very large Chinese buffet. 
You, you know, if he decided he would, if you have to do this or I'm going to stop eating here. That would be very, that would be very powerful for Michael Moore. Hugh Hewitt is a uh, radio talk show host, and uh, and I, I enjoy listening to uh, to Hugh. He talked about how uh, maybe people are just getting sick and tired of the attacks, and I think part of it is that. I just have to disagree with Jeff, though. I, I This morning on this radio show, I had uh, Archbishop Philadelphia, uh, Charles Chip Hugh on, a moderate, uh, a nonpartisan fellow who is amazed by the hostility that has greeted the new president from the media. And I do believe the hair trigger criticism of everyone is wearing out its welcome with America. And if the new team gets a shakedown cruise period of time. So the overblown hysteria and Jeff was just venting it there about transcripts that we may or may not exist that have not or not been seen, like the BuzzFeed dossier, which was trash. I think most people in America are getting tired of the pile on 24-7 on the new president. Had a very successful weekend. And Mike Flynn, by the way, had a very successful statement about Iran. We haven't seen any Iranian speedboats charging at American destroyers since General Flynn made his statement. So all in all, I think the original team is still there and Donald Trump is sticking with them. Okay. Uh, another story that I saw the other day, and it's not all going to be about Trump today, but there just are a lot of stories that I think are kind of interesting. Uh, this is a story, uh, the uh, the National, what is it, uh, National Organization for Women. You know, now it's the National Organization for Leftist Women, essentially. It's not the National Organization for Pro-Life Women. It's not the, you know, it's not the inclusive National uh, Women's Organization. It's a leftist organization. It's been around forever. They have said that they are going to boycott a, uh, and this is a store in Virginia. It's called Wegmans. It's a terrific store. I, I loved it. I used to live near one. And uh, Wegmans carries 237 Virginia wines from 58 different wineries in its local stores. All right. Including five from the Trump winery. And Trump apparently a few years ago bought this uh, Charlottesville, Virginia winery for $6.2 million at a foreclosure in 2011. All right. Even though the guy's not, a, he's, he's a good investor. He's not a drinker. He doesn't drink wine. Says, I'm uh, really interested in good real estate, not so much for uh, in wine. This uh, place had a $28 million mortgage on it, and I bought it for $6.2 million. It's a Trump deal. So he got a good deal on it, and he's selling the wine. And now is saying that we are going to boycott. All right? We are going to boycott. The problem is, and now the, the, the store has been carrying the wine since 2008, before Donald Trump owned it, all right? The problem is, <clears throat> even if you wanted to buy Trump wine at Wegmans, it's sold out. It's been sold out for months. <laughs> so people, people, when Donald Trump was running for president, they went out and bought them out and have been buying them out ever since. Now you're a little late to the party, okay? Just, just a little late to the party when it comes to uh, Trump wines at Wegmans. They're, they're already sold out, so uh, boycott away, I guess, right? Oh, yeah, and by the way, the Women's March, uh, the, the, the day without a woman is uh, March the 8th. Uh, that's the date of the International Women's Day. I mentioned that earlier this morning. It's put together by NARAL. NARAL. What a terrible name for a for a, a feminist movement. NARAL. It just sounds like somebody, no, nah, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> I'm not going to go there. What did we do? Let's do a day without white guys. What the hell? Why not do a day without white guys? Uh... You know, there, there are a lot of hard-working white guys out there. There are a lot of uh, white guys out there who drive the economy. There are a lot of white guys driving trucks and, and working in coal mines and working in steel mills and working in, uh, in, in auto factories. And, and let's not forget uh, the CEOs. Let's not forget. There are a lot of, I think we should do a day without white guys. You want to talk about, and I'm not meaning to make this into a big race thing, but if you're going to throw this at me and you're going to say, uh, day, you know, you're going to have uh, illegals taking the day off and immigrants taking the day off, and women that are taking the day off, then why the hell don't we, uh, instead of uh, saying that it's all about white privilege, why don't we just have white guys say, you know, screw this. Honestly, all I do, uh, I, I'm, everything I do in my life, everything positive, every achievement that I have, people, some people are going to say it's because of white privilege. Can't get anything right here. So how about we do a freaking day without white guys? You know, I'm going to work on that. I want to do a day without white guys. So, yeah, we'll see, how, we'll see what happens. All right? Okay. All right, let's move on to some other stuff. I do have some more Trumpy stuff that I'll get to here in uh, in a few. Uh, I'm going to get to Ashton Kutcher. He uh, delivered some powerful testimony on Capitol Hill yesterday. And here's a, this is a guy, and normally I'm very anti-celebrity 
uh, cause thing because a lot of them it's it's rather selfish. A lot of it is self-aggrandizing. Uh, you know, they, they had that unfocused women's march in Washington, D.C. the day after Trump's inauguration, and Madonna was up there using foul language. Uh, Ashley Judd was there reading a stupid, um, a stupid poem by a misguided 19-year-old that was inflammatory. And, uh, and, and that's, to me, that's fake activism. They, they don't know exactly what they're lashing out at. They know that they support Bill Clinton, who molested his way to the top, and, and, but they, uh, you know, can't handle a Donald Trump, a guy who had a conversation illegally recorded and then shared, and uh, he was talking like guys talk. I don't talk that way, but uh, you know what I'm saying. So that's that's fake activism. Ashton, he is really putting his money where his mouth is, and he's putting his resources where his mouth is, and he's created this terrific, terrific charity that is, uh, its goal is to stop child sex trafficking. All right, here he is yesterday. Uh, this is about this is about two minutes long, but I, I think what he says is very powerful, and and I can I commend him for the work. And by the way, it's working, and I'll share the results coming up. Here it is. And this is about the time uh, when I start talking about politics that the internet trolls tell me to stick to my day job. Uh, so I'd like to talk about my day job. My day job is as the chairman and the co-founder of Thorn. We build software to fight human trafficking and the sexual exploitation of children. And that's our core mission. My other day job is that of the father of two, a two-month-old and a two-year-old. And as part of that job that I take very seriously, I believe that it is my effort to defend their right to pursue happiness and to ensure a society and government that defends it as well. As part of my anti-trafficking work, I've met victims in Russia. I've met victims in India. I've met victims that have been trafficked from Mexico, victims in New York and New Jersey and all across our country. I've been on FBI raids where I've seen things that no person should ever see. I've seen video content of a child that's the same age as mine being raped by an American man that was a sex tourist in Cambodia. And this child was so conditioned by her environment that she thought she was engaging in play. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. By the way, his uh, uh, website for this charity is wearethorn, T-H-O-R-N dot O-R-G. Here's Aston Kutcher with another story that he's witnessed. I'd like to tell you a story about a 15-year-old girl in Oakland. We'll call her Amy. Amy met a man online, uh, started talking to him. A short while later, they met in person. Within hours, Amy was abused, raped, and forced into trafficking. She was sold for sex. And this isn't an isolated incident. There's not much that's unusual about it. The only unusual thing is that Amy was found and returned to her family within three days wow. using the software that we created, a tool called Spotlight. And in an effort to protect its capacity over time, I won't give much detail about what it does, but it's a tool that can be used by law enforcement to prioritize their caseload. It's a neural net. It gets smarter over time. It gets better, and it gets more efficient as people use it. And I love it. I love it. And here is uh, how effective it, it, that, that software has been. In six months, with 25% of our users reporting, We've identified over 6,000 trafficking victims, 2,000 of which are minors. This tool is in the hands of 4,000 law enforcement officials and 900 agencies. And we're reducing the investigation time by 60%. This tool is effective, it's efficient, it's nimble, it's better, it's smarter. I love it. I love this kind of activism. This guy is, he's, he's uh, obviously very passionate about what he's talking about. He's very committed to it. Uh, I think it's terrific. And, I, and he's not doing it because, look at me. I'm on stage at we, you know, uh, America for Africa. And I'm on stage for, or USA for Africa. Nothing against those movements, but they were by and large uh, to be seen. This not so much. All right, we are thorn.org. We are thorn.org. 
And uh, on the, the cover of it, it says, uh, Thorn drives technology innovation to fight the sexual exploitation of children. I've been involved in uh, the prevention of child abuse uh, and helping kids who have been abused for a couple of decades. Uh, I went through some rough times, some rough spots when I was a kid, and it's important to me. So that's why I, I give the guy big old round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so did you know the American Girl doll is going to have a boy now? Huh? The, the American Girl doll, and it, I, we got the catalogs for American Girl doll. And my daughter really never got into it. But yeah, yeah give them kudos. I think they're... It's, you know, it just seems to be a sweet company. Here's here's uh, the story on their new American Boy doll. It's a boy. For the first time in American Girl's 31-year history, the doll maker is introducing a boy. His name is Logan Everett. The 18-inch brown-haired, gray-eyed doll is from Nashville, Tennessee. He is dressed in modern attire with dark wash jeans, a t-shirt, and a button-down. Logan comes with his own drum set and is accompanied by his friend and bandmate, country western singer Tenny Grant. American Girl has been on the forefront of progressive toys for all boys and girls. Among progressive the- toys? They're, they're progressive? What? what? The other new dolls to be released this year includes an Asian doll, a Hawaiian doll, and an African American doll. An American Girl spokeswoman said that a boy character has been a top request from fans for decades. As more and more parents and children ask for diverse characters with different interests and experiences. The company says Logan is meant for boys and girls. For now, Logan is the lone boy in the American Girl lineup. But could this trailblazer pave the way for future boy dolls? Perhaps America. Okay, well, you know, we'll see. And, and I'm sure somebody is eventually going to say that it shouldn't be called American Girl. It should be called American Boy Girl LGBTQ. <laughs> something's gonna happen well, i have no problem with diversity on the, on the on the dolls and you know i could see where if you've been a minority in the country uh you know we've been lily white for a very long time and the toy aisle has been lily white for a very long time although things are changing well, pretty darn dramatically so a boy doll for american i don't know whatever i don't care <laughs> i don't care here's uh something this is a story out of um orange coast college coast of mesa california um, a kid recorded, a student recorded a, uh, an anti-Trump diatribe from a teacher, from a uh, professor, and posted it on social media. Now, this teacher, apparently popular, and uh, this is a course on, I believe, human sexuality, but she felt the need to vent about Donald Trump, uh, saying that his election was an act of terror. Here is some of the audio from the from the actual uh, tape the kid made on a phone. Pat, that's right. In an exclusive interview, I spoke with two of the students who were in that classroom when the video was shot. Now, neither has politi- serious political leanings, but they both say they couldn't believe what they heard. It was kind of just shocking. Breaking their silence over a classmate facing suspension. Students shouldn't be shamed for their political views or who they vote for. Wait till you hear this, guys, what she wanted people to do. For For weeks, Orange Coast College students Noah Ferber and Tanner Webb have kept quiet, they say, to protect their grades after their professor Olga Cox went off on Trump and his supporters just after the election, calling him a white supremacist. It's an act of terrorism. But they say when they heard their classmate who shot video of her lashing out could be suspended and face legal action, they say they had to come forward. I wanted to defend the classmate. I didn't want him to just be the only one who thought it was wrong. The president of the teachers union calls the video a setup. He claims it was edited to make the professor look worse. But Tanner Webb says it's what happened after the video was turned off that had him squirming in a seat. Professor Cox, he says, asked Trump supporters to stand up. She was saying demonizing things about Trump supporters, so nobody felt like they should stand up, you know, me in fear of my grade. And then she said, I bet none of you will stand up because you're embarrassed of yourselves. The rest of the... No, it's not. It's not because you're embarrassed of yourself. It's you are afraid to stand up because you know this psychotic woman will dock your grade. These, these professors hold kids hostage 
when they decide to espouse their political views. I don't understand the need for it. There's some control issues there. They obviously feel a position of power, and they have a position of power over the academic success or failure of students. And unfortunately, many professors, there's no doubt, I'm sure, discriminate against conservative kids. A little more from the story. Class should look out for them and know who to protect themselves from. Nobody's going to stand up and be publicly embarrassed by a teacher who, you know, holds the power in a classroom like that. Thank you. The teachers union stands behind Professor Cox and warned the student who shot the now controversial video could face legal action. We think it was unethical of the student to do what they did. The union I think it's unethical for you to, uh, not to stick to the damn script and human sexuality and hold people hostage to your political views. In president says the popular human sexuality teacher was simply using hyperbole oh, or yeah. exaggeration. Sure. The faculty of Orange Coast College don't believe that students are these fragile individuals that cannot hear hyperbole and that they need to be coddled. These students say it's not about being coddled. Are you kidding me? There are universities across the country that have safe spaces when conservative views are being espoused or conservative speakers are allowed on campus that's when they're coddled it's, it that makes no sense whatsoever it's about being bullied and now they're speaking up and they should and they should and and if he gets suspended i hope he goes somewhere else and he starts to go go fund me page for his tuition because i'll contribute to it i will contribute to it Whoopi Goldberg, you know, not only uh, is Donald Trump under fire, but uh, his kids are under fire as well. Ivanka, her, her, her products are being uh, removed wholesale from uh, dozens of retailers, being taken offline, uh, all of these things. And then the other day, uh, apparently uh, Tiffany Trump was at, uh, I guess it's Fashion Week in New York. And I, 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 I just find uh, fashion shows to be insufferable. But uh, she was there, and uh, magazine editors apparently took pictures because no one would sit next to Tiffany Trump at the Fashion Week. Whoopi Goldberg actually spoke with some common sense and called these childish morons who would say something like this about Tiffany Trump. You know, she calls them out. Elle Magazine's senior fashion editor tweeted that she and other editors changed their seats so they weren't near the first door to Tiffany Trump. These are, these are adult editors from Elle magazine, acting like mean girls in a school cafeteria. Yeah. There were also photos posted of Tiffany with empty seats next to her. You know what? Tiffany, <clears throat> I'm supposed to go to a couple more shows. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm coming to sit with you because Good. nobody is talking politics. At the, we're not, you're looking at fashion. Yeah. She doesn't want to talk about her dad. She, she's looking at the fashion. And for Elle magazine, a magazine that says it's a woman's... Okay, I just can't really handle the voice much longer. It's a magazine. Well, maybe it's just not the whole magazine. I mean, it may be a couple of people, right? But, yeah, but still, yeah. but they, they, the bad apples have represented themselves. Uh, yeah. Okay, so, yeah, they, they're acting like children. The, the catty children. But, I mean, you'd never expect that at a fashion show, right? <laughs> Cattiness and, and childish behavior. No. <laughs> Nothing like that going on at Fashion Week in New York. Some of the most insufferable people in the world. Um, okay, so Matt, uh, Matt Damon is doing a, an interview with People Magazine to promote his new movie. And uh, Matt Damon says the Mexican government is not going to pay for the wall along the country's border with the United States. I'm not a believer in walls, he says. I believe that history belongs to the cooperators, and nor am I of a mind that Mexico is going to pay for our infrastructure any more than we're going to pay for their highways. You know what I mean? That's just not going to happen. That's where we are, and we'll see how it plays out. Uh, Matt was promoting his new movie, the Great Wall. The movie's actually called, it's about the Great Wall of China, which was meant to keep people out. <laughs> I know, I can't make this up, man. Woolly Mammoth. It looks like scientists are on the verge of recreating one. They're going to de-extinction. It's a de-extinction effort. All right. Scientists are aiming to produce a hybrid elephant mammoth embryo. Apparently, they're getting very, very close. Now, I didn't realize the woolly mammoth vanished from Earth about 4,000 years ago, so it hasn't been that long. Now, scientists are on the brink of bringing it back. Did, did they not see Jurassic Park? Do they not know 
I, I think it's fine. I think it's fi- uh, fascinating, and and I and I don't believe in the uh, apocalyptic um, Jurassic Park model. Okay, <laughs> it's just, you know, obviously it's a movie. Uh, I'm fascinated by this. If if they could bring back a dinosaur, I would love to to, to see them bring back a dinosaur. That's never going to happen. It's just not going to happen. But a woolly mammoth, they've got actual frozen woolly mammoths that they found completely intact DNA. And, and there's a real good chance if you could do it with a sheep 20 years ago, you might be able to do it with, a, with an elephant now. Pretty interesting. Finally, uh, members of the Harvard Computer, Computer Club just wanted to have a little fun for Valentine's Day. So they, they created a system called Data Match. Boy, this has got to be a really cool place. This group, Harvard Computer Club, I bet you they're super cool. It would help students find companions for the holiday, but unfortunately, they only included two genders in data matches options, and now they're in big trouble. They're big trouble. 26 members of Harvard's undergraduate council signed a letter admonishing the dastardly programmers for not including other genders, including gender queer and gender non, non-gender conforming as a list of options. Instead, they just had uh, male or female. Which is actually, those are the only two sexes. But, you know, that said, they've taken a a lot of heat. Students uh, said that the setup was insufficient because it implied that the gender binary was normal. Male and female is normal. I know. Calling gender nonconformity or any gender non-binary identity extra is sort of tactless nomenclature, according to one student. When will... The madness end. Okay. Well, there is a time when the podcast has to end, and that would be right about now. I greatly appreciate you uh, joining me today. This is episode number 35 of the Rob Carson Show podcast. Again, check out the new website, if you would, please. It is at uh, robcarsonshow.com, robcarsonshow.com. Also, the uh, Facebook pages, Rob Carson Show and Rob Carson's Table. All right. And if you can, become a patron by uh, giving a uh, dollar a month or five dollars a month or ten dollars a month or whatever to my Patreon account, p a t r e o n dot com. Look for Rob Carson Show. It would be greatly appreciated because it keeps the lights on. If you're up uh, and you're not sleeping tonight between uh, midnight and three, listen to KMOX in St. Louis. Stream it or listen to it if you are in the St. Louis area. Actually, it's a huge station. So you can hear it all across the country. In the meantime, God bless. Have a good one. And we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to The Rob Carson Show. Friend him on Facebook at Carson Show, on Twitter at Rob Carson, and on Instagram. Uh, I think Facebook and Twitter are enough for now. We'll see you soon.